Wow, that was something special. We're getting highly technical here at Red Hoop Talk. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Red Hoop Talk, show number 53. My name's Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the chief executive and attorney for the Association on American Indian Affairs, who is bringing this to you here today. Welcome, everyone who's out there live watching. We've got a a very good show. It's going to be intense and highly academic. So if you get your glasses, you may need them. So I'm going to wear mine so I make sure I'm I, I'm looking smart and educated. Um, and we're going to have a really good conversation later today. But, but uh, let's start off first with, oh, yeah, I've got to, I've got to, I always forget all of the, the, the beginning things, the, the logistical things that I'm always supposed to share so that you all know that um, uh, we would love for you to follow us, like us, subscribe on either Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. And it would be really great if you subscribed and commented on YouTube. Uh, so that one day uh, we can monetize this station to give a little income to the association for all the wonderful programs that are happening there. Um, I'm coming to you live today from the original homelands of the Piscataway people, um, otherwise known as Maryland by uh, those uh, colonial types. And um, I'm just north of the... Uh, what can we call it? The the head of the serpent, Washington, D.C. Uh, so I bring you greetings from that place. And speaking of the head of the serpent, um, one of those raised his head uh, this week. If you didn't hear uh, Mr. Rick Santorum in his fun little speech to young conservative Americans um, where he said, uh, what did he say here? He said, we birthed a nation from nothing. I mean, there was nothing here. I mean, yes, we have Native Americans, but candidly, there isn't much Native American culture in American culture. Thank you, Rick Santorum. You are so ignorant. If I had some kind of wonderful button to push to kind of like, uh, maybe a fart noise would be good at this point. <laughs> that, that would be helpful. Um, uh, there was a huge outcry from Indian country. Um, Fawn Sharp, who's the president of NCAI, made it very clear about the complex and significant cultures that were here and still are here today. CNN hasn't really apologized. And so if you want to, if you're feeling like, you know, poking the bear somewhere, uh, poke a little bit at CNN. They, they pay this guy uh, to be intelligent uh, an intelligent correspondent, not an ignorant uh, racist one. So uh, we don't need folks like Rick Santorum um, uh, teaching American youth or on CNN. Uh, so thanks everyone for showing up. Hi, Ann. It's nice to see you. We have folks joining us from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Please feel free to make yourself known. Say hello. Let us know where you're coming from. Let us know what you think of Rick Santorum. Hey, maybe you maybe you like him. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Hey, JD, nice to see you out there on YouTube. Um, speaking of something a little more less ignorant, let's talk about some good things that are happening. I'm going to share... Just like maybe 15 minutes ago, uh, Congress reintroduced the STOP Act. And if you don't know what the STOP Act is, it's Safeguarding Tribal Objects of Patrimony Act. And what this, this act came about because of, of stolen cultural heritage uh, that was going uh, overseas and being sold at auction. Um, and wind, wind up in, in private collections all over the world. What the STOP Act does is requires people who are exporting Native American cultural heritage to prove that they have uh, proper ownership and title to it. 
Um, though that may not solve all our problems and may still allow items that are sensitive to go over the borders, what it does do is it alerts um, Homeland Security, it alerts tribes and others about certain types of items that are being trafficked uh, over the border. So there are some strong protections in there that we haven't had before. It certainly doesn't solve anything. So don't, don't tell me mm, it doesn't do what we need it to do. NAGPRA sucks. It doesn't do what we want it to do. And the STOP Act's based on NAGPRA, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. This is one stepping stone to get us to some better laws. And we hope uh, during this administration, we're able to expand cultural heritage laws, including the STOP Act. So in the meantime, on our website, let me see if I can get you the um, uh, indianaffairs.org um, backslash STOP Act. I'm going to put it in the chat here. Bam. Um, what you can do is, um, if you are a museum, Native nation, Native artist, attorney, academic, um, anyone, uh, write a letter of support. Um, send it to us. Um, we have a guideline on our website about uh, the letter. Um, we also have our letter of support that you can look at or you can encourage your Congress folks directly to pass the STOP Act. And we have some information on our website on how best you can do that. So that is my latest legislative plug that I hope was helpful to everyone. Hope everyone's having a good week. Um, I got my first COVID shot uh, and uh, so far so good. Um, and not getting sick, not getting weird, not turning into a lizard, not, um, um, but something weird's happened to my hair. I don't know if anyone's noticed. <laughs> I chopped it all off. Oh my God, she doesn't look like an Indian anymore. Well, I never did. Did I, did I really ever look like a Native American before? I mean, what, you know, what those colonial settler types um, think a Native American looks like. So I'm expressing my diversity and my culture um, by having short, curly hair. Um, and speaking of uh, curly hair, um, if you weren't aware, there is a Facebook page called Curly Natives. So if you happen to be like some of us with some curl going on, um, uh, not sure what gene that came from, uh, then go to Curly Natives' uh, Facebook page. It's a private Facebook page. It'll help you help you figure out how to deal with these this, this hair we have here. And speaking of Curly Natives, um, our guest tonight is one of those Curly Natives, Miss Mashana Goman, who is Tanawanda Seneca, um, from a place I think is so special in, in New York. Um, welcome, Mishana. It's nice to have you with us. Hello. It's nice to be here. Sikana, everybody. Thank you. So um, you are a beautifully curly native. <laughs> and I'm jealous of the haircut. I've yet to be able to get an appointment in LA. <laughs> oh, hey, all you have to do, you just pull it back and, and chop. And you'll oh, have my daughter's been cutting it. <laughs> oh, has she? <laughs> I was gonna say, then you'll have a nice like, like uh, what do they call I don't those? Know like... I trust her that much. She has lots of talents. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mishana, you are an academic galore. So you're you're teaching critical race theory. You're the head of the Native Studies Department at UCLA, and you're teaching gender studies, right? You, did yes. I did I get oh, that? Well, not chair of American Indian Studies. Not chair. Anymore, thank goodness. So yes. Oh. I'm the special advisor to the chancellor on Na Native American and Indigenous Affairs, and it's American Indian Studies Department at UCLA, of which I play a part. Yes. Thank you for correcting <laughs> me. <laughs> oh, um, that's fine. Um, no, that that's beautiful. It's a um, lot of American Indian, Indigenous, and Native Americans, so we get all of the elements in there. <laughs> Well, and it's such a it's such a spider web. When I look at your career, um, you know, you 
you have such a spider web of work and it's not like, you know, someone who is in Native American literature and they put forward literature and they're in literature classes and that's what they do. But you are in uh, American Indian studies and other related areas and you're doing literature, you're writing, you're doing academic, you're doing repatriation, you're doing land acknowledgement, you're, you're, you're all over in, in those areas that I think are so important and needed in Indian country. Um, I'm going to stop there because I want to make sure we recognize where you're coming from. And uh, it, go ahead, Ms. Shana. Well, I, I come to you from, I got caught with the curly haired thing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I come from, I coming to you today from Tavangar, which is the Los Angeles basin. And I'm on the land of the Gabrielino Tamva. And I am currently in Westwood, which are the closest village site is Caravangna. And I'll be out there tomorrow volunteering and doing some uh, hoeing and planting. But I am actually Tanawanda Band of Seneca from New York, uh, outside of Buffalo. And I grew up also in Maine uh, and um, in Penobscot, Passamaquoddy areas, uh, in uh, Skowhegan, Maine, actually, which was quite a controversy a little bit ago uh, for its mascot issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up there on and off. My dad was an iron worker. So we lived all over the East Coast, all the way into, he did iron work as far as Ohio. And then um, we just traveled with him wherever we went. So <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So, um, uh, so were you born in Maine or? Yes, I wound yes. up, yeah. <laughs> I was born and, in Maine. And now you're on the completely other side of the this. sunshine. <laughs> yes, yes. Sunshine and beautiful, and beautiful, you know, Southern California Indian land. I'm very fortunate that Chumash has some beautiful land that's right here on the border of LA, as do the um, San Fernando Tataviam people, which are in San Gabriel Valley. Uh, I'm firmly situated in, in Tomba territory right now on the west side of LA, but all of those places I travel and, um, and also work with those tribal leaders. We also have to the south and Orange County, the Hotchman people, and um, just past Long Beach. So just to recognize everybody in the territory, everybody, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a territory with a lot of vast histories and, and wonderful people. That is probably just in the last, what, 10 years, really getting uh, some headway and really becoming uh, more prominent. I mean, even on the on the Oscars, what when yeah. was that? Was that uh, last Sunday or a couple of Sundays ago? Yeah. Um, the first one was done two years ago by an Indigenous Maori man. But. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then this this time it was the actual what president of the Oscars or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was the first time the org itself recognized. Yeah, yeah. So that that was pretty cool. So so, um. I do not take academics lightly. I mean, you your journey through academia is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's any easier today, um, uh, but I, I commend anyone who um, gets their PhD as you have. Um, what, well, first, you know, what, <laughs> what puts you on the path to go there? I have to say, you know, when I was when I was younger, there was a moment in high school. I was um, I had moved out of my house at like 16 and went to Portland, Maine to live. And I was waiting at tables. I started waiting tables when I was like 13 years old. And there was a moment I had to decide whether I was going to go back and finish high school, even though I had really good grades and I had, you know, all that. It was just um, there was a lot going on. So. I uh, did decide to go back and and um, I finished high school. And at one point somebody said, oh, Dartmouth, they have a native program. Maybe, Mishana, you should go check it out. And so I was able to get a ride with one of the other kids who was, whose family, he already had brothers there and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I went um, to Dartmouth and checked it out. And there was a huge native community there that appealed to me. Um, 
especially being isolated in that area of Maine where, you know, our closest, I was isolated, but not really. I was with my family, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy people would always stop down, Malisee, you know, I have relatives. Eventually I had relatives. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. I had, <laughs> had Micmac relatives. Um, so they would all stop by at a place called 12 Corners where I grew up. So Dartmouth kind of appealed to me that way, a place where I could meet multiple different uh, people. And I did, and I met the most wonderful people that I went to school with there and alum that I even sensed that weren't there, but I've become friends with. And it became a really important part of that burgeoning of, of who, I, who I am as, as, as a person. So in my commitment, I, you know, I, I came in a little a little rough, a little rugged, a little. <laughs> um, so, but I was always kind of an activist and stood up for things. And so um, I did a lot of that work. And for once I was doing it with people with me, which is NAD, the Native American at Dartmouth crew. Um, I had people to work with, which really informed a lot of what I, what I did. Um, and we have one faculty member and she was, you know, she was an English professor. I, I, you know, our freshman spring, I set in on native lit class and it just came fairly easy to me. And it's the first time I ever read a book, which was love medicine by Louise Erdrich. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it was the, it was the first native book I ever got to read. Right. And I knew mm -hmm. who I was as a person, you know, and it, it with my family, trust me, nobody ever, Nobody ever let me forget who I was as a Tanawana band of Seneca woman. That's how us Haudenosaunee roll. <laughs> yes. And, you know, we don't even call ourselves Native American. That was like, you know, that wasn't even allowed where it were you know, with my family. So, um, so I read Love Medicine and it had this incredible impact as something, the first thing I ever read. And I just did really well in that class and it wasn't a struggle. It didn't seem hard. It seemed pleasurable, a pleasurable form of learning to read something so intense and meaningful and help me process some of some of my life in some ways. Right. And um, after that, uh, the professor, because I, I did really well, she she was this kind of she was um, a non-native woman who saw her role as finding students who could replace her. In the academy that's what she told me and um she would always take a group of us five native women from all over the place L lakota and you know just other um other well i was the only holding one but anishinaabe students and she would took us all kind of under her wing and would take us to the you know fan what at that point in time was just the fanciest dinner i'd ever been to and uh she just kind of nurtured that and she helped me get into the fsp in london um, where I mostly looked at Victorian lit, but I like a little drama anyway, so it was it was good. But I really realized I wanted to do native lit, and um, that's kind of the path that that led me there. And I, while I was at Dartmouth, I was one of the first people I petitioned to do a major in um, Native American studies there. And uh, because I took, I had taken all the classes, I had enough, you know. I, concentrated more. Most of my English classes, I tried to work that in somehow. In my AFAM classes, I would look at the trickster figure. In my Toni Morrison class, I looked at um, Song of Solomon, which has a deep indigenous element to it. And so in all these classes, I just kind of tried to work it out, like how I could how I could get to that point of major and really explore just the different ways of being indigenous. And I, I have to say, like, being in that environment early on with um it was rough at times because there's you know not we're not all alike and we all especially when we're young we're we're all trying to find ourselves anyway even if we had these kind of perfect families which we don't i always remind <laughs> i always remind people mess the colonialism was messy and we are too <laughs> and um you know, I it, it I came in. It was a little rough at, at first, and um, 
But at the same time, I just really was, had really wonderful friends that I made for life, lifetime friends that I still have and still work with. Today, they were circulating a picture of Powell, which was in 1992 or something, where we all look so young. And um, <laughs> amazing, amazing picture and reminder of a group of people I really care and care about and love and, and look at as, as my mentors. We mentored each other in a very hostile, colonial environment. Um, so then after that, I really realized that the only way I made it through there was to go to a place also um, for my graduate level work that I wanted to undertake that didn't contain me in a literature department, but would have broader implications and let me do scholarship, engaged scholarship, community scholarship, activist scholarship. Um, and that's how I found myself at Stanford because it also had a very strong native community like Dartmouth. Right. So I, I found myself in those two places because of the strong native community and because of the ability to kind of do interdisciplinary work that the program in modern thought and literature allowed me to do. So I took anthropology classes, I took history classes, theater classes, because um, you take nine lit, nine other classes. So, you know, to find those classes relevant at Stanford is very difficult. It's still very difficult. It needs to grow. They need to hire more Native professors. So, um, you know, I, I, I think working in that environment, again, it was a lot of self-learning and self-taught kind of elements, but uh, it allowed me to create that interdisciplinarity that you see in my work now. I always, you know, pe people are like, well, I don't know, you know, and I'm like, I'm not the the it may seem I'm schizophrenic, but it all looks right. If you're doing if you're doing work in an indigenous communities right, you're including women, you're including history, you're include you can't do native lit if you don't know Indian law at least a little bit. I don't know how to think like a lawyer, but I do know enough. I have had very good, uh, wonderful uh, colleagues in law, such as Angela Riley. The first thing I ever published was with Kristen Carpenter, which I always tell Angela Riley, <laughs> who's a pretty prominent UCLA law. I was like, I was the first co-author. We wrote a piece <laughs> on Roma Man Killer. Uh, so I always had this strong propensity to trying to combine and broaden out all the fields also that I, I work within and and look at and I just mm -hmm. I just love learning about the, the different ways different disciplines can really highlight different issues if we only work in one lane I don't feel we're addressing that messiness of colonization right mm -hmm. it's in all different kinds of ways to make colonization operate and function as a structure in this country and it's going to take all different kinds of ways to to disrupt it and tear it down. Yeah. So you didn't get pulled into that. Um, wasn't about, wasn't that, well, it's probably uh, different times this has come up, but that pull to be a part of a kind of broader ethnic studies where they lump all the brown people into one uh, group was did Princeton and Stanford try to do that a lot. So it was harder to, 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 to locate in American Indian studies specifically because because of that poll? You, you know, it. I've always found that, yes, it was hard. It was hard to get the actual training in, in Indigenous studies. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, I took a lot of Chicana studies, cultural, cultural studies, Chicano studies. But I was able to articulate from such a strong point because of my undergrad at Dartmouth where Native politics were and where native trajectories were for with anthropology and history and literature that I, I didn't get sucked in because I had that strong formation in indigenous studies first, right? Mm -hmm. And in and, and Chicano studies, it was a listen of trying just to trying to learn to listen and think through. I mean, um, or Latinx studies might be called, I can't remember what it was called then, but my professor is clearly situated in Chicano studies. Um, she was wonderful, Avon Yarbrough Bejarano. She read 30 native novels for me for my death exam. So it was like a cross learning kind of thing, right? Like I had to learn from her methods and she learned from me the field of native lit, but she loved reading the literature. So I think for her, it allowed her <laughs> the excuse. And we are such beautiful native authors that I think people, especially other literature professors sometimes just wish they could you know, sit down and read all those those wonderful authors. Oh, yeah, um, sure. 
for sure. Yeah, so how, it, how long? It was you... hard. It was hard. I, but I think there's a way we have to realize some things are incommensurability. And we have to also mm -hmm. realize those fields. Like I was in some heated Chicano studies class discussions that had nothing to do with me. It had to do with, you know, different kind of way. Like that's not a cohesiveness either between Latinx and Chicano studies and that, right? Mm -hmm. They have their own kind of uh, formations as well. So trying not to get sucked into that um, was was important, but I had great AFAM professors, uh, Sharon Holland, who uh, really wanted to know and learn and saw indigenous studies as relevant. So I've been very fortunate throughout my lifetime. Oh, I should turn that off. Throughout my <laughs> lifetime to have uh, have uh, professors and educators who wanted to learn and and think with me and think through uh, what at that time was just a developing field, particularly in relation to feminist and gender studies. But I'm also mm -hmm. lucky because I had strong grandmothers who were my original teachers. Yeah, for sure. So how did you, uh, oof, um, I know mm -hmm. um, a academia, especially law school was really difficult for me and, and, um, and, it was family and people who were close to me that really kept me centered. How long did it take you to get a, a bachelor's, a master's, and then a PhD? I, I hear some people who who are, it takes them a lifetime to finally get their PhD. Um, how was that for you? How was that process for you? Did you just, what would you tell other people? Is it about support? Is it about focus and discipline? What is it, what makes oh, you gosh. successful in that? That is a good question. So my plan B was always law school, right? Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, sometimes now it's still my plan B. Uh, <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> well, that's what all my lawyer friends say. Um, but it, that was always my plan B. So I always felt like I had that back up. But um, it took me it, it took me six and a half years to get through the PhD. And then I did a postdoc at Berkeley. So mm -hmm. it. It, so it, you know, I had two kids along the way. So I think that drove me like I, I came in. So when I got into um, when I got into Stanford and, and a couple other grad schools, uh, I found out um, three days after that. Oh, Sedona. Um, hi, Sedona. That's hi, my daughter. Sedona. <laughs> hi, Sedona. Come say hi. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Hi. <laughs> I forgot where I was. Oh, I was pregnant with that one okay. <laughs> when I arrived my first quarter in grad school. Mm -hmm. And she's the best thing I ever produced. So um, I, I wound up showing up pregnant. And I just remember it being very difficult. You know, I had I had a department chair particularly tried to sabotage me and kick me out because I was pregnant and told me I had different priorities and all of this. But again, I feel like my, the strength of my mother, I knew what she went through, you know, as, as, as a woman to have my brothers and I, and, you know, not have any money and live in poverty and such. And then I was like, I have a degree from Dartmouth. I can, I can do this. I can do this. I kept telling myself, like, I have it, you know, a little better. But there were times that it was really hard. I, you know, when they put the kids to bed, I was reading late. And mm. I don't know, there was just a drive there. And um, also doing something. I had wonderful undergrads that I work with that are now all fancy people um, all over the place, dentists and doctors and all scientists and stuff. Um, so I think running those mentor programs really kept me really stable and grounded when I was when I was doing the PhD. I think one of one thing I find people do is that they um, put just everything into overproducing the academic part of it and not also given time to where where people ha working with why you're doing the PhD in the first place, right? So I think having that undergrad population, I thank them. Just like when I was at Dartmouth, I thank the crew. I learned more from students 
Native students that I work with, I learn more from the, the people that I'm friends with and the circles that I am, people from all different kinds of tribes than I'll ever learn in a, a Native Studies classroom. And I tell my students that today. Like I can teach you methods and thinking, but you learn more from just sitting, talking, introducing yourself, talking about your stories of where you came from and how you maintain despite it all, like, you know, how you maintain who you are as a person. You know, that's that. I guess that's how I got through. I just, you know, those conversations and and people I envisioned might be in my cl classrooms later on. And um, now there's some of those students have kids that are now at UCLA, and so that's exciting. Wow! <laughs> yeah. Wow! So how long have you been at UCLA now? <laughs> About ten years. Yeah. So you you've kind of made years. what's that? <laughs> Eleven, actually. Time. Eleven. Yeah, so yeah. you've made it, you're a tenured professor? I'm, yeah, I, I received full last in 2019. So can you let everyone know what that means and what it takes compared uh, to, because there's, it seems like there's fewer and fewer of us that are getting um, tenure. Um, so right. can you talk about that a little bit? I, you know, I, I feel like there was a moment that I was lucky there were people that were moving up through um, when you're when you start as a junior faculty, most of the time, if you're in Indigenous studies, not in every discipline, but you have to write a book and produce a book. But you have to run that book through everybody. So my first book, mark my words, is um, very theoretical, and it's it's very very theoretical. I'm told my family was like, ah, I got to page five, and then I liked it when you were talking about us moving around as a family. But they're like, I don't know. My mom was like, Mashana, what is that word? What do you what do you mean spatial? What do you mean? It is, it's, you know, it was um. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me read this. It says, "Mark my words, <laughs> traces settler colonialism as an enduring form of gendered spatial violence, demonstrating how it persists in the contemporary context of neoliberal globalization." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so, intense. Yeah, it's so you have to kind of perform. In, at that time, I was in an English department when I wrote a majority of this book. So which uh, English departments like you to cite the field, cite either authors and do that kind of work. So I had a clear idea of what I wanted to talk to. The book actually started with my experience as uh, a curly haired Indian woman <laughs> traveling with my family to different territories and what that meant. Like uh, in some places I was completely read as Indian. Um, because I was in uh, like white rural Maine where nobody forgot I was an Indian. Like I, like people always assume that because I have all this hair and I'm blonde or whatever, that, um, you know, I have some kind of identity issue. I don't. I grew up in an incredibly racist place. I got strangled on the bus when I was in kindergarten. Yeah. Just like incredibly racist. It was the 70s. People didn't like Indians in the 70s. It goes in and out of fashion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um so it's still racist today. Actually, it's just always been racist. But um, I think, you know, I grew up in a place where two of my uncles were murdered. That would be considered hate crimes today. And I grew up in a place that just was incredibly, mm, just, just incredibly anti-Indian. Mm -hmm. And um, even though they say they love the Indian mascot, but that's, a, that's another story we can talk about later. Right, right. Uh, there was no honoring going on when I was a kid there at all. Um, so there's a particular way that traveling and then we would travel with my dad when he was in our two home bases were the res in Maine. And so when we traveled with my dad, that was a different experience. Like pe some people would read me as white and it didn't gel like when I'm eight years old or nine years old, except then when my dad comes to pick me up, I never got invited to play again because they realized, oh, that kind of, you know, people would say, you look white, but not quite right. Like that kind of saying, <laughs> it's horribly racist. Um, so these kind of, this is kind of the, the spectrum. So I realized that the scale of the body, it travels through those spaces as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, like there's a particular way I think Indian identity is simplified as though it's just on the outside or it's not in attachment to your family. But 
when it comes, my brother's name is Michonne. I should be honest that. <laughs> he does Michonne not. Michonne and Awesome. Yeah, it was the 70s. Our middle, Ray, our middle names are Sun and Ray. So um, <laughs> um, my dad's name was Michonne. That's not a coincidence. Um, well, his native name, it was John Paul, was the name he gave <laughs> to um, settler authorities. So basically, in thinking through that process and not having the anxiety that people expected me to have, I was like, I, you know, I was like, how, how does this work? Like, first of all, um, when I was writing the book, and I think things are changing now, um, there was that dichotomy of the urban res. I didn't fit in any of those kind of stories because I was like, first of all, my my family practice what I'm what I call sovereign mobility. Uh, we move through spaces, and wherever we went, we introduced ourselves to native people, and we we didn't right. see you know there was like a, a mobility there uh, with my dad's iron work, which is every three to six months of our lives. So you as a, a native person, you don't travel alone in the world, right? You travel with your family and your uncles and your cousins. And I just always had everybody around me. So there is a, a particular way when we want to talk about these kind of issues, we talk about it as singular, singular issues as though native people are traveling alone in the world. You don't, you travel with your cousins, you travel with you know the, the spaces that you make and work with. So um, that's kind of what the book is really about. <laughs> there's a lot, I know there's a lot, there's literature involved, there's deep analysis, and uh, there's lots of ways of talking about how the state tries to confine us, confine our bodies into spaces, confine our bodies in general. Um, what What is a native, you know, in terms of gender, um, native women have faced this massive spatial violence through the years, whether it's dispossession through allotment or uh, other forms of Indian policy, like um, uh, the Indian Act in Canada, which is one of my chapters. There's all kinds of ways these gendered forms of violence are about confining native women in spaces or taking away those spaces from control of our ability to govern ourselves as we want with this kind of sovereign mobility, which is what I'm working on now. But um, there's a particular way Native women have always had a way of thinking and mapping their lives in, a, in important ways. And the book is kind of inspired through my own childhood and mapping our lives and, and what that was like, so. Oh, I love it. Well, I, I wish I would have uh, uh, had time to read it before the show. That It sounds fascinating. So, so you wrote a book and you got tenure. Yes. So was it like automatic like that? Here's my book. And it goes through all of those processes. It goes through all the hoops and what did the Academy think letters. of your book? Um, I got really good reviews. It's just yeah. it's funny though, because when you're in indigenous studies, you're expected to do everything. You gotta cite all the white authors, then you gotta cite all the Indian authors, then you gotta cite just it's just you know, there's no boundaries. And so one of the things I thought was funny was somebody said, oh, they didn't, she didn't work on indigenous Mexican authors or people doing geographies. And it sometimes it's a matter of, you know, I defined the parameters of why I was working with Canada in the mm -hmm. US because mm -hmm. I'm Haudenosaunee first and, and mm -hmm. I, there's only so much one can do in a small monograph where you you have that's what people don't realize sometimes you have a small you have a certain number of pages and the press can't go over that because then then it's too expensive to produce the book um so there's also a particular way in the field people want to see themselves often and mm -hmm. Um, but the book did well and I had articles to go along. You have to do a lot of articles as you go along too that don't have anything to do with the book and peer review processes can be very painful as well. So um, the book goes out for review. You get it, you get your file assessed and then you just got to hope for the best and you got to hope it doesn't get caught at the top by the scientists and stuff that are sometimes can be very anti-Indigenous. So yeah, so so you yeah, we don't have science supposedly. Yeah, There's right. a lot of rich santoriums in the academy as well, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and still, still today, without a doubt, and I'm sure more back then. Not that yeah. it was that long ago. Um, <laughs> so you made it, um, and so with tenure comes a certain level of freedom. Mm, no, yes and no. no. <laughs> 
uh, as a working class woman who grew up with a dad, you know, iron work is about you have a job, then you don't have a job in four months. You know, it's like, you know, constantly like that. My mother worked in the paper mill um, in Maine. So that meant she was always, um, and that didn't start happening until um, my latter years. I was in college. So anyway, like her working, um, it was it was the idea of having a constant paycheck. I remember that being the relief and not the yeah. tenure. Like, you know, yeah. there's a particular way that having a constant paycheck in your life is like the relief. I know that's not very glamorous, but you know, if you like growing up um in in not a wealthy household, very poor actually. I grew up with all my aunts and uncles and everybody at a place called Twelve Corners and it you know, running water and without running water and electricity, having a constant paycheck for the rest of your life is something that's like <laughs> meaningful, you know. Uh, but it also came, comes with a lot of responsibility. I really feel that people who have tenure should try to pull up uh, graduate students that are working on their degrees, making sure they always have a safe place to go, making sure they get the info that I feel like I didn't necessarily get in my graduate education at Stanford, right? Like, this is how you do it. No, I remember trying to read through like 30 history books and the history books were just huge. Somebody had to tell me how to read the history books so that I could get through the list. And and there's sorts of those sorts of elements to it. Yeah, they, they don't tell you that. I know now Wait, like, no. yeah, with, with law school, there's actually a summer program that, that you can do with other indigenous students called PLSI um, uh, that kind of teaches you how you need to do law school. Is there anything like that for um, indigenous students who are trying to get a PhD or going into certain academic fields? You know, I think later on there is, um, I'm part of the yeah. Summer Institute in Global Indigeneity Studies where we work with Pacific Islanders and indigenous studies students um, and from also from Latin America, indigenous uh, studies. And so that institute helps, but it helps probably in like the second or third year with the project. But um, as far as I know, I'm sure some people probably do. Uh, some of those people that have um, that have uh, very strong indigenous studies programs might have it. Like I imagine University of Minnesota, like places with stronger with strong Native faculty might have it. Right, right. And, and resources, honestly, it sometimes you know not enough people focus on graduate education. And the lack of resources that I'm finding across universities for graduate education is what's what's holding um, that back or, or stopping the pipeline from being as strong as I think it could be, mm -hmm. right? Graduate mm -hmm. education is very expensive and there's not a lot of funding. And I think there's a lot of, you know, there's pressure for diversity, but then I feel like that, you know, the kind of mantra sometimes can become in these departments. Um, oh, well, there's no qualified native people. Oh, we don't have anyone to work with that native people, with that native person on indigenous. We don't have anybody in this poli sci department that does indigenous studies. You know, um, we just got a junior faculty there at UCLA, by the way, she's awesome. Um, uh, Desi Lone Bear Rodriguez, so we're very excited. But that said, what it does is it stops those kind of ability to, ha to have people that then become tenured professors or full professors mm -hmm. at institutions. And so I think what we're seeing is kind of a, a, a freezing up of graduate money to go back to your question about where maybe there was more resources. Mm -hmm. uh, we see kind of a freezing up of that, of that um, graduate money. And so therefore, it's 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 uh, much harder for departments, especially in public universities, to admit those students in. And then we see with the private universities, there's not a lot of indigenous faculty in them, and I'll I'll hold their feet to the fire there. I know Duke is just trying to do a five person cluster hire, but it came out really late, and we'll see what happens. So, yeah, I just um, I'm going to be teaching at Johns Hopkins. Oh, that's exciting. Uh, Nagpra. Um, uh, uh, taking over a class that a wonderful person and, and scholar academic um, built, April B. Saw. She's in at Vassar. Uh, she was teaching the class before, but there's, there's no Native students. There's no Native 
faculty in the, it's a museum studies program, right? Um, but now there's me. So, <laughs> oh boy, have they better watch out. I hope they do <laughs> what they're getting into. <laughs> what I find actually is that when places don't have somebody or when those students don't have it and they get in your class, they're really willing to listen. I think graduate students want to learn and want to listen. They're a different generation than not everyone, of course, but um, the ones I usually find myself in contact with, they're wishing their departments had an indigenous person in their museum studies. Mm. And so I think, you know, it's a good way to create allies across the, across the way. Oh, for sure. that. So, but for I'm sure. excited that, you know, NACPRA needs to be taught. It's 30 years out and people have not returned and done the due diligence. It's kind of what led to our COA project that I do with Wendy Teeter, who is yes. the NACPRA coordinator at UCLA. Who, who, who thinks you, um, you rock. And I know, I gotta like, she's just being nice. <laughs> Hi, Wendy. Um, yeah, Wendy's great from uh, from Fowler. Um, yeah, COA is a great project, and I have a whole bunch of videos I need to give you all to upload from our repatriation conferences. By the way, so so tell everyone what COA is. I'll, yeah, I'll, bring, I'll bring up the website. Sure. COA is called Carrying Our Ancestors Home, um, and it's a it's a really, I think, an important project because I'm, I kind of did the administrator, the institutional arm. Wendy, do, Wendy does the content arm along with uh, uh, my daughter's the archaeological lab manager at UCLA, and she's our project manager on COA. Mm -hmm. Um, they do the content and that kind of, Sedona does a lot of the digitization and curation part and working with the students on this. So basically we use, we kind of um, organized this talk because uh, Wendy and I came together. We actually have a talk on this at Stanford tomorrow at 1.30 if anybody wants, or 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock mm -hmm. or 1.30, uh, if anybody wants to pipe in or come to see about it. It's on Indigenous uh, NACRA and Indigenous collections or, I don't know, Phil Delory is on there. There's myself, Wendy, and other people. It'll be great. Um, Ooh, we're mad at Phil right now, though. We're mad at Phil right now. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we'll talk about We can talk about that later. All right. Um, well, what we're doing is uh, we decided this project needed to be done. And this might have to do with that because nobody's listening to the side of the tribal practitioners in NACPA. Like, in, and uh, we were talking, and Wendy and I, and because, uh, you know, I work closely with Wendy on a previous project, which we can talk about, um, we realized that. The, there's a particular way that indigenous studies theorists that are trained are talking past the practitioners or not to there. There's like a hole there that's missing. Mm -hmm. And then there's the lawyers too. Right. right. And so, and, and everybody has these different perspectives, but as one of our, and, and hopefully we get to see the video today as one of our, our practitioners talks about the law is only as good as this implementation. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't have people with intent, Wendy, thank goodness, has had intent. So UCLA has one of the, the best records in the UC system. I think it's the I think it's fair to say the best, but um, we know who it's better than anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it, in that case, like there has to be an intent with the repatriation officers. There has to be conversation between TIPO and cultural people. And we realized. I realized this because when I came and I first started talking with Wendy and we first started doing things together, I was like, just give it back. Just give it all back, which I feel on one level, but I had no idea how complicated the process is. And what does it mean to reinter people in ceremonies? It's just so much work on the on the part of tribal practitioners. I assumed that universities were taking on the responsibility of finding a place, of finding the resources to reinter people, which is often not the case. It's something that doesn't get talked about, a very practical. I'm also a very practical logistic person, which is probably how I made it through the PhD. But it, that doesn't get talked about enough, that actually financially logistics, where, do, where does that happen? So I think sometimes in indigenous studies, from what I'm doing in terms of that uh, humanities social science, that we have a very kind of theoretical part of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. I first learned NAGPRA from Suzanne Schoenharjo, I have to say. Um, she was an yes. incredible mentor. She's also one reason 
how I made it through Dartmouth. And she kind of took me aside. She was the Montgomery. She's the she's the kind of person I idolized as wanting wanting to be as a scholar and as one of those one as as you know she just kind of idolized her kind of way that she she worked with things. She was a Montgomery Fellow at uh, at Dartmouth in 1992, right after Nagpra had passed. Um, and what she did with the fancy house they gave her on the pond, it was this big, huge, fancy house. She just opened it up for two weeks to the whole native population, all the native mm -hmm. students. She took us aside, she brought us to lunch. She she just used those resources to create this incredible community. And, and it was a mixture of having fun, but also learning from her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She how she organized herself as an activist. It was one of the, the most momentous times of at, my, at, at Dartmouth for me. Yeah. So basically, I, uh, yeah, so- you want, me to, you want me to play the, the, the yeah, trailer? Yeah, no, play it. That will, that will give us something to talk about. I feel like I'm rambling, but that was an important part to know because that's who I wanted to be. And that's, I want to know how people work on the ground. That, mm -hmm. that drives me, right? Right, right here. Let me get, let me pull it up here. Make sure I get the audio and we're going to share. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh -oh. Books her. have tried to erase us. It has been taught so much that American Indians are dead and gone or vanished. This is a study about a culture and a group of people that are still alive. Integral pieces of our values, our life ways, who we are, are being ripped away, thrown on a shelf. It's like having a relative in jail or in prison. I've often used the word lost, but then I, I didn't feel comfortable using that word because we never lost it. It was stolen from us. Why do you have them? And what are you doing with them? And what is the purpose? And how did you get them? It's heartbreaking to watch your ancestors being extracted. It feels disrespectful. It feels hurtful. It feels like a violation. It creates this imbalance on the land, in our families, in our communities. In essence, we're professional mourners. We're just trying to make ourselves whole again. And repatriation uh, gives us that opportunity to do. So Native people are seen as the relics of the past, but also uh, returning remains are seen as anti-scientific, and that is a... No. Oh. What happened? We'll give it a minute. Real problem. I actually heard this from several people that that tribes wouldn't have a history if it wasn't for archaeologists to, to preserve them. People in archaeology um, and related fields saying that the passage of NACRA and the requirement of repatriation was like the burning of the library in Alexandria in ancient times, that it was the destruction of knowledge, and that we as a university had to resist it at all costs. You can't legislate intent. So as much as NAGPRA is seen as a way for tribes to have access, if the institution doesn't feel like this is an important law, doesn't understand it, doesn't really, isn't really invested in creating a collaboration between the institution and the tribes, you're not going to see good work being done. There's still a lot out there that needs to be fixed. It might get fixed and might not. It is a persistent. You just insist and insist and insist, and ultimately people will see that you're not the threat, you're not the enemy, you're the solution. And they can be the solution. I think everybody should be proud of who they are, no matter. But don't steal our identity, you know, because we don't go do that to anybody else. And they wouldn't let us. The time has come for us to write our own history to tell our own truth. Lulu, Lulu, Lulu. <laughs> Don't want to do it too loud. 
That's wonder. Whoops, where did you go, Mish Mishana? Uh oh, I'm losing control of the computer. <laughs> Give me a second. Sorry, I'm having dif technical difficulties. There we go. It kicked me out for a second. I came back in before yes. the storm ended. So. <laughs> oh man. Um, that that's a great trailer for what the the COAH is is doing, and I'm so glad the association is a little part of it too. Um, it's such good work, good storytelling. Yeah, I just think those are the stories we need to hear. And yeah. I think that will get more people on board. But I also I also just have learned so much from listening and hearing those stories. And a lot of my views have changed. And um, we wanted all of our videos to be for teaching and learning in the classroom and to keep the students interested. And I think Tribal elders are a lot easier to teach than my giving a lecture about Nagpra sometimes. <laughs> I'd rather listen to them, so. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and there's tons of videos. So on that website, um, if you all are looking and I put the, um, the website on in the chat, um, there's tons of videos to look at. And like I said, Wendy, I gotta get you a bunch of, of, of videos uh, to, to upload in there. We have some more from our repatriation conferences, so. Yeah, and if anybody has any material they want, they can. I'll put the the name of our project manager in the in the chat, and um, they can they can. If we're looking at COA as being the a resource management for any kind of NAGPRA documentation. We have most of the bills are on there. We have a timeline for NAGPRA, which is one of the things that we wanted to resituate. We wanted people to recognize that NAGPRA just didn't come about in 1992. I think people think sometimes that's, or 1990, oh my God, my daughter. <laughs> I keep saying 1992 because that was like when Susan showed Harjo and I just did that in an article and I'm so embarrassed. But anyway, 1990, when it yeah. came into fruition, um, I, I think that, you know, that happened much longer before that with American Indian activism in the 70s, etc. So retelling that history is important. We have a blog by Suzanne Schoen Harjo, which I believe is up now. Oh, great. Um, and, you know, talking about that important, important history that needs to be addressed and discussed. So yes, yes. So everyone go there, check it out. <laughs> um, and, and keep checking it out because more and more stuff is going to and if you don't think, I know everybody's talking about this right now, especially in California, because they just passed Cal NACPRA and other elements. If you have anything that you feel would be a good resource and a teaching resource, please send it our way. I'll post the link. Okay, good deal. Um, and yeah, and the link for your talk tomorrow, who's, um, where is that happening at? It's at Stanford. Actually, um, is it? Is it open to the public? I think so. I It should be. I tend to try to only do things that are open to the public. Um, yeah. I can post it on Twitter. For I, can, I can. I'm going to Google it real quick. Yeah. It's the TAG conference. I don't know what TAG stands for or something. Theoretical Archaeology Group. That's what it is. Oh, TAG. Not TAD. Not NAG. NAD. <laughs> Um, oh, there it is. Okay. So I'm seeing tag, uh, 2021 at Stanford. So it's a general site. So I'm going to sit, put that. That first panel plenary session, the keynote session is, uh, some of what I find to be the most ethical, beautiful, uh, indigenous archeologists out there, Dorothy Leopard, Desiree. Oh, yeah. Is, you know, it's the whole crew. So if you really want to learn from them too, they take that that conversation between the theoretical, what can be, you know, mm -hmm. that's what the theory is, what can be the possibilities um, and the practitioner, the ways, the process and on the ground. So there's some amazing people. Yeah. And um, we have our repatriation conference coming up in November and we're hoping that COA is going to be involved. <laughs> And so maybe we can do some joint work um, for the repatriation conference. So I'll, I'll get in touch with you and, and Wendy. We'll see what we can make happen. 
Well, we just got a grant to make more uh, more videos and work with more tribal people across California. We're working with UCR, UC Davis, and with Beth, Beth Middleton Rose, who lays Sinogeny, and mm -hmm. Kat Whitley at UC Davis, UCR, Cliff Trasser, Mark Mintz de Leon, um, and then in San Diego, where we are working with Isabel Cordova and Kiolo Fox. We're going to have one on genomics, a film on genomics, um, and uh, one on uh, climate change in Puerto Rico and what that means for preservation and health and wellness. I'm doing land and art. It's going to be really exciting, and it's going to be a full class that we hope to work on uh, cultural heritage, preservation in difficult times. It's mm -hmm. called Century Tribal Stories in Difficult Times. So wow. I'm really excited wow. about this project because I just, you know, I, uh, it's going out and having storytelling and listening to stories and learning that way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so Robert Noonan on YouTube says, which genius picked this day and time Go back to the old way, Sunday at 7 p.m. <laughs> All right. So, so we have to we have to take a pause, Mishana, okay. and we have to address the time change for Red Hoop Talk. So um, Sunday evenings is kind of my last hurrah to be with my family. Um, it's a difficult time for me, Robert. So I hope that you will forgive me and instead come join us on Friday or you can watch us streaming on Sunday at a time that's convenient for you. Um, but Robert, I don't know if you're subscribed yet to YouTube. So um, uh, let's get you to, to push that button and, and subscribe. Okay, enough about that. Mishana, so it's not just repatriation work that you're involved in. Like I said, like your, your academic work and career is, is, is like a spider web. Um, you're also doing some work on land acknowledgement and creating some really interesting interactive maps. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. That was a project that we did in 2015. Uh, it actually starts with repatriation in some ways. Does it? In, in some ways it does. You know, I was out at the Pimu uh, Archaeological Field School, which I was, I think, what was I doing at the time? I, I had some admin position. I can't I remember. I hate these it. archaeological field schools. Are there good archaeological field schools out there? Well, here in Desiree Martinez run an excellent Okay. Thing. Okay. So it's out on Catalina, which is Pimu in the, Tomba. Okay. Gotcha. And so they go out in the middle. I think, I, I don't know, I've never been through a whole one, but I have fun when I go out there. Uh, <laughs> but I don't exactly, you know, get the rocks and do all that. Um, <laughs> so um, what I, you know, I was out there and um, there was there was just a lot that was going on. And I realized that people weren't talking amongst each other in indigenous protocols. They weren't talking to the Tomva necessarily. And I wanted to kind of look at what are ways to create cross communication between people, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was talking with Maylee Blackwell, who is my co-PI, who works with Latin American indigenous diaspora. Keith Camacho, who's Pacific Islander. He's awesome. He just went to Guggenheim. He's Macho amazing. Camacho. Yes, he is a little Macho Camacho. <laughs> but he's a wonderful Pacific Islander man. He's not that Macho. He's a sweetie. Uh, uh, yeah, he calls me some word, which I don't know. He's good working with Haudenosaunee women. Let's just say that. Those PI women have trained him right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, was working with him. And so what we were all talking, we get to understand indigenous communities and where they're at in LA amongst each other. But we quickly realized that not everybody knew each other. And so it kind of became a way, like how can we begin to introduce and especially so people acknowledge whose land they're on with the Tomba. So um, Mapping Indigenous LA came about making that present, but not as a, uh, not just as an additive approach, but how do you tell your own story? So we went to the community and they were interested, which is always a first step. I think there's been lots of mapping projects since then. And I don't know. There's a lot of people who take the model of mapping Indigenous LA and right. make their own maps. They have a lot more money and they're prettier, but are they talking to the community is the, always the question. Oh, right? yeah. and Definitely. I feel like 
you know, we've done things on the cheap, but we've tried to provide money also to the community when this happens. It's been driving me a little mad, actually, like people expecting free labor just so just so they can um, present these projects. But, you you know, you need to support the community that you're working with. And, and I work closely with the Tomva community on the maps that we did. Wendy has been working with the Tomva, Tatavium, all the communities across California, really, and training their youth and doing these kind of projects. So when we, when we were doing this project, um, we've just thought, what can we do to create people's presence, even presence of Pacific Islander people, right? LA has some of the largest populations of Pacific Islander, largest population mm -hmm. of Latin American uh, indigenous peoples. And when they come here, they don't lose their connection with community. They actually have set up housing authorities. One of uh, my students, who's now a professor at Loyola Marymount, she has some great work on this, Brenda Nicholas. Um, Nichols, she has excellent work on her Zapotec community. And she talks quite a bit in her work about, you know, uh, they, they set up these housing, um, housing kind of authority elements. They come together as community to support each other with mutual aid sort of work. Uh, Melanie Yazi was talking about this in an earlier discussion I was at today about how indigenous peoples have been doing mutual aid before it was called mutual aid in this current system. Like you support each other for funerals, you support each other for birthing, you support each other for crises and pandemics. And um, I, I think there's a particular way we just wanted people to talk across these vast geographies. LA is kind of difficult because Getting from one side of LA to the other is longer than my getting from Buffalo to Salamanca. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like five miles equals 62 miles in some of the places I grew up. <laughs> wow. So, I think I think these maps are just really meant to tell a story of placemaking and not just documenting a history. It's like some of the pretty some of the maps have um, that quiche. Is, that's a, a house, a Tomba house that's being redone uh, actually at Caravan this springs. Um, we're really, you know, we just we wanted to present that story and present it from the perspectives of the people themselves and how they feel about their own placemaking in LA. And for the American Indian community, that became important also. Uh, it's one of the, the largest American Indian communities. We at times worked with the uh, AIAI, which is the American Indian Involvement Association. Um, they, they are the largest organization in LA. We worked with uh, we worked with the Red uh, Cir Red Circle, which is the first Indigenous aid activism for the health and resource maps, and an education map. So um, we're we're just kind of responding. We're still responding to what communities want. Throughout that process of mapping Indigenous LA, we realized communities also wanted to talk about cross currents, places they can meet and work together and stuff. So we're working on some cross current maps as well. Wow. Wow. And the Pacific yeah. Islander map will be out soon. It's taken a while, but it's going to be beautiful. Fascinating. Fascinating website. Yeah. There's so much there. Yeah. Um, so everyone, please go check that out. That's great. That's we also realized there needed to be teaching sources. And so lots of, there are tons of teaching sources. And one of our talks, uh, they had us come talk about the project. And it was to a teacher certification uh, element at, it was run out of the AAA. But the teachers all brought what they were teaching because they wanted somebody to look at it and say, is this appropriate? Does this work? And we're like, oh. <laughs> you know, I don't know that one. There was so much bad material out there that uh, we worked with Craig Torres in particular, but also Julia Bogany, who recently passed, which is sad to me, and Barbara Drake, who also recently passed, and um, Teresa Ambo Stewart, and, um, we worked with uh, a lot of the cultural educators that were going out and around to all the different communities, Barbara Dre, I, I think I said, um, and we developed curriculum from their perspective, how they want their communities taught, because I think that's always important. So, yeah, for sure. And, and so how do you, you know, you from writing uh, your book that was highly academic 
that your own family had trouble getting through. Yeah. <laughs> to, I said they made fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've got I've got friends of mine who still roll on the floor laughing, think that I ever went to law school. It just doesn't uh, make sense to them um, uh, to to work that seems more grassroots on the ground. Um, how do you reconcile being an academic and doing all of this? What what to me looks like fun community grassroots work for indigenous peoples? Are, are they are they the same? Are they are, are do they somehow meet in the middle somewhere? Uh, I think sometimes I think you know the I look at my book mark my words as the as the theoretical in the in mapping Indigenous LA was a praxis of that you know mm -hmm. of trying to think through how how do we break these colonial containers right of geographies of who we who we are like how do we how do we put aside the colonial, you know, contraptions that that I think prevent us from working together, right? Like, and I see the the praxis coming through. So, so I think the academic work for me is thinking through that. Um, it's it's something that I I have to do honestly in order to in order to be able to make resources in the university happen where they should happen. Sometimes you need what we've realized. Um, you need a faculty member, you need a tenured faculty member, and you need somebody in, in those positions um, in order to, in order to get those resources to go where they need to go. And um, there's been times where I've been wanting to like, uh, pull in a community member, but they had to have an organization they were attached to, or, you know, there's all these ways that universities and, and being respectful of the knowledge Native people have put up barriers consistently in your in place. And I think you can navigate it a little better if you're a, fac a tenured faculty member, but there's all these barriers, I think, to getting in to to making sure those indigenous knowledges thrive and practice, right? right? And sometimes I'm a little less concerned about bringing them in the academy for, you know, I know there's dangers in that as well. I've seen times when I've brought knowledge and I see it translated in weird ways and that can be kind of dangerous and, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it doesn't go quite the way you want it to. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah. So you have and, to be like, hold on a second, you know. Yeah. And, I, and more and more tribes are, right. yeah. And more and more tribes have their own research protocols and yeah. how you're going to interact with them yeah. um, uh, and, and puts more formality uh, in the process. When people approach me and I tell them that, they're shocked that that that's even exists. So for some for some reason, it's like all of a sudden people, particularly climate change, is such a big thing, and people are realizing, you know, indigenous people need to be included in those discussions. Um, they hold, I think, the most important resources. It, but then I say, well, did you talk to the tribe? Does, do you need an IRB? Do you need, you know? And they're like tribes have their own IRB. So I think there's sometimes there's just a kind of obliviousness because our academies don't have enough. We don't have enough tenure track scientists, life scientists, or physical scientists and those things. We need, we need more. We need more in the med schools and, yeah. and all of that. So what about the, the, the opposite? So uh, a lot of academia holds our uh, tangible and intangible yeah. traditional environmental and, and cultural knowledge. Um, how do we strengthen research protocols to require ac academia to consult with tribes before they release that information? How do we, how do we build those relationships in, in academia so that our information is not shared, that our ancestors aren't being um, uh, studied? Uh, what and it's not think? extractive. Like exactly. I, I've been trying to work on ways in American Indian Studies at UCLA, and I, you know, I train a lot of grad students right now. And well, most a lot of them are native, but the ones that aren't, they know not to be extractive because you put them in conversation <laughs> with each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a way that people are can be quite extractive. 
we have in American Indian Studies at UCLA a, a class that was in place before I came called Working in Tribal Communities. Um, it's also making the university aware it's for their own benefit too to have mm -hmm. a Working in Tribal Communities class because states like Minnesota, uh, they offer wonderful certificate programs through University of Minnesota at Duluth. Um, mm -hmm. Jill Dorfler as the chair there, she, she kind of runs a lot of those programs. But uh, they're one of the highest tribes or some of the highest employers in these areas or even in California, right? Mm -hmm. And they get very little for how much um, through the state, comp state compact, how much money they give in terms of education and those sorts of things. It's very little. I, 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 I actually, you know, one thing I would love to see happen in California, in a, I can't do it at UCLA as a special advisor because apparently it takes legislation at, at the level of the UC. But I, I really think California Indians should have free tuition, for instance, right? right? So I think there's ways to start to make this happen where our knowledges and our materials um, can be taken care of and, and worked with, but it requires the presence of students on campus. It requires... It requires also for the faculty that are there to see the significance of um, traditional knowledges and also to respect that and not be extractive. Like it's a reciprocal relationships. It's not transactional. I think transactional and extractive are the worst parts about the university. Right, right. And control. And it's about control and power. And, and it's a place where uh, indigenous peoples and tribal nations haven't had any control or power. Yeah. And, and how many careers, how many institutions have been built, not just on our lands, but how many careers have been built on, um, you know, the abuse and use of our traditional and cultural knowledge. Uh, there, there's no recognition um, about that. And without our, you know, free prior and informed consent. Yeah. I think about that a lot, as particularly anthropology departments. I, uh, you know, we have a, I like the chair of anthro right now, but there's a particular way in anthropology departments that they like to be like, oh, we've moved on. Those people in the past, they didn't do things right. But that's not us now. Now we're, we're but it's like, you still haven't dealt with it. There hasn't been a reckoning, so to speak, with, how anthropology departments have developed in the US. And I know there's good anthropologists out there before it gets put in the comments. I, you know, one of my best friends is an anth she's native, but uh, <laughs> is an anthropologist. But um, you know, I I I I think the reckoning and understanding that it's the university's responsibility to return those items and it's not just a demand that you have to comply with, but there's actually a deeper responsibility that exists. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, if your anthro department is seen as never one of the top anthropology departments or the first anthropology department, maybe you ought to think about how that happened, you know. Right. Right. And Right. And I, I really, I really think there needs to be more reckonings in terms of those sorts of processes. Yeah. And and the reason why I'm a little upset with uh, Phil Deloria right now is because the the association has been trying to push Harvard and also make sure that the public and students and alumni know that they have almost seven thousand ancestors that are. Uh, like 96% of them are considered unidentifiable, even though there's geographic and other information with these ancestors. And, and what's interesting about how Harvard looks at the NAGPRA process is they, they are well documented. They over evidence their um, NAGPRA work. So where NAGPRA and, and congressional intent and NAGPRA kind of provides this process that can be as simple as the parties want it to be, right? Um, what Harvard has done over time um, is put a lot of money, a lot of lawyers, and a lot of evidence behind this determination that these ancestors unaffiliated. And one of the things that 
that Mr. Deloria, um, bless his heart, I almost want to say, said um, in a in a news article after we had submitted these uh, communications to Harvard, was that we're waiting for the tribes to prove it up. We're so basically the way they're looking at um, repatriation decisions is that. Um, they're waiting for the tribes. They're making, they're forcing the tribes to um, have the burden of proving contrary to the evidence that Harvard is collecting. Um, so that's not the repatriation process. That's a scientific pro project. That's a research project. That's not this legal law that is meant to repatriate. Um, and so it's almost like the intent so what you were talking about with the, um, you said it so well when we were talking about COA, mm -hmm. about the implementation. So the law is really dependent on the intent. The law is only as good as, the, the implement, as, good as its implementation and intent. I think, yes, you know, yes. when he says that, Angela Riley says that mm -hmm. consistently, I remember thinking, that's my problem with the law. The federal Indian law is so crazy. I always know the intent is to colonize, not to. <laughs> but see, but see, what I always hold on to is is I always push back and and say, you know, this law was intended. And sorry, I'm a lawyer. This law was intended to benefit tribes. That's yeah. it. It was it was it was created for what's called in law as a special class. Of, of individuals based on a fiduciary relationship that the U.S. has for tribes um, and for the benefit of tribes and for no one else. And the law says that expressly. And so if that is, that's not the spirit of NAGPRA, that's not some kind of pie in the sky, oh, we want to do our best to protect cultural heritage and repatriate when we can. No, this is for the benefit of tribes. And so they are the voices who should lead the process forward, not a bunch of, um, you know, Harvard um, archaeologists, science, science, scientists, and researchers who are are working to do just the opposite. So it, it, well, it's if you're it's really the tribe, fund the tribes too, yeah. fund, fund the people that need to be in that room, or fund a pathway for them to come to campus, or. Yeah. Or, you know, these are expensive. It's expensive for tribes and often tribes that don't have any money. And it's, yeah. it's, it's wrong anyway. Even if even if a tribe is rich, the university made their reputation off those objects. Yes, and, and off, continue to. Off yeah. our ancestors. So they should be continuing to provide, you know, provide housing for somebody for three months or, you know, something like that. Create a pathway to that is is right. it, that would be my it, I, you know I I like Phil um, I do too no I do too I, I nothing bad about Phil I, I think he, but he's, yeah but Harvard maybe ought to put a little bit of that money that it earned from becoming uh, Harvard through you know being a, a school founded for Indians put a little money on that and make sure the pathway is there for tribes to do that to do that work that 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 collaborative work to bring ancestors home. Yes. Yes. Well, and and for Harvard to freaking uh, change how their intent for implementing yeah. NAGPRA that's in line with law, um, instead of you know keeping the law from being implemented. But anyway, that's enough out of me about <laughs> that. I love Phil Deloria too. I know he's in a position where he is not on the ground doing repatriation work. He serves on a committee and is being told by, by staff at Peabody Harvard how things work and how they're working things, uh, other things. So yeah, and that's know, what needs to be in the academy sometimes. Right. Sometimes exactly. I it's don't agree with insular. With, my name gets put up there and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> it's hard that way. It's like, you know. <laughs> hard for academia to listen to voices outside of it. So even with the repatriation work, they're not inviting any tribes from outside to help review their policies, help review their research protocol. Um, tribes 
don't seem to be involved in it. It's it's completely insular at, at Harvard. And that's not what we want. Um, yeah. We're so happy that like Berkeley's under new management. We're so happy that Cal NAGPRA is, is, is changing things in, in California because that has been problematic yeah. for, for so long with repatriation. What I don't like though is when universities are like, oh, we, we're doing this. I was like, you didn't do it for years. You're doing that because you're responding to what native people want. Like native people need to continue to get the credit or, you know, indigenous people continue to get the credit because they're the ones pushing this forward and pushing for a return home. Yeah. And, you know, to me, universities sometimes swoop in and they're like, oh, we're doing this great thing. It's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> it took years to get it to that point, but you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, so you're also doing some stuff at Buffalo and you're doing a lot of, it seems like throughout your career, a lot of mentoring. Um, and so you're really connected to people coming up in their career and, and you're also connected, um, uh, to your home in Buffalo. So it's nice that you're spending yeah. some time there. Yeah, you know, I got to spend the fall there. Uh, it was a little hard because of COVID. It was it just, it's been a hard year to finally get to go back home on a fellowship and, and do that. And then it, everything was pretty much shut down, you know, kind of want to, I saw my cousins, um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to have, but, uh, I, I, you know, I love them. Um, so I did get to see some people, but I didn't get to fully participate. I, you know, every fall as an academic, you're also stuck, te you're stuck teaching, but you're stuck in, and, you know, if you're away from your home teaching, you're stuck in certain places, so you don't get to see things. So my dream is to see the great law read in person and, um, you know, that's the, the like, I, I had some of those kind of hopes and dreams, but I did get to go hiking in the fall and smell the water and the trees mm -hmm. and, and, uh, travel through my homelands. And that was incredibly important this fall. It was, it was good. It was good to be home for the brief period that I was. Yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet it was. Yeah. It's so beautiful there in the fall. It's also good to be in Tonga in, in February as well. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> For sure, except now it's like all uh, going to be drought and just more climate change crap and, and pollution and water issues. Um, it sounds like so. I'm I'm praying for everyone out there. Um, Me too, and I, I I'm just hoping that more uh, indigenous knowledge gets put into how California is going to deal with that climate change issues. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. So what do you think, uh, Mishana? Do you think we've, did we hit everything? Am I, am I missing something that we need uh, to talk about? No, I just really thank all the people that I've worked with throughout my life and my friends and my mentors and uh, especially, uh, you know, people like Desiree Martinez uh, and Craig Torres and the Alvitre. Julian Barbara who passed like all the Tomva mentors who really taught me what it means to be in this place. So I really, you know, so much of my work is deeply um, devoted to them. So yes, uh -huh. I get teary eyed when I talk about Julia and Barbara because I just think that was uh, it was a huge loss. And I have multiple projects I was doing with them um, that go beyond the land acknowledgement that I worked on them with, as well as the language speakers. Um, and I'm hoping UCLA soon will have a new uh, a new spaces of Tomva reflection. Um, we're working with the botanical gardens and other parts of campus to really do a gathering, caretaking, and harvesting element on campus in Los Angeles. So I just encourage all of you who are academics maybe, or maybe not, or community members that might be able to work with somebody that you know, put them on the spot on their land acknowledgements and really try to create those spaces on campus. And that's, that's what we're doing at UCLA. So I just wanted to say that, like, cause I feel, I do feel very indebted and lucky to have worked with, with everybody. And um, I always laugh and say, uh, Desiree Martinez, who has the rumple still skin of the Tomba, she took my firstborn. Um, <laughs> so Sedona, my daughter, who's our project manager for COA, she actually has just been an 
credible. She knows so much about the area as well because of these also tribal elders and cultural educators and leaders who just know so much. And I just think those stories just aren't told enough. And I see this all throughout California. Mia Lopez works with UC Santa Barbara, has taught me so much about that area and land and community engagement. So I just like to say, you know, go out, learn and, and learn from your cultural educators and tribal leaders and bring them into campus spaces because a lot can develop, but ask, ask people what they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to, uh, I was a, uh... I did my undergraduate at Cal State Pavagna. Ah. Um, yes. And um, uh, I was going to ask you if you knew how the lawsuit is going there about all the gravel and things that were being dumped on the, on the site. Um, have you heard anything? Um, yeah, I have to say that um, that is a question for the tribes to work out, the descendants of Pavanga to work out. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very complicated issue. I don't think um, it's to me, it's not like Standing Rock where there's definite no, <laughs> no fucking pipeline. Right. Yeah, right. Or, or like when they tried to, you know, put fracking water in our river and the Seneca people, we, we got that handled in 48 hours. We're like, no fucking way are you putting, you said I could square. So I'm going to take yeah, this no. time to do it here. <laughs> no way are you putting water in that river. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. If all mm. soil is sacred, then we got to think about that. But I think that's an internal issue for people to work with for right now. And um, I always kind of adopt one of the ways that I, I think I've been able to work in California is by listening to everybody and taking, you know, that's your canoe. This is my canoe. I'm not from here. So let me just be a resource for people to try to try to work through things and not get involved. <laughs> yeah. A little two row wampum <laughs> wisdom right there. A little two row <laughs> wampum wisdom. Yes, I have to say, <laughs> but you know, that might be a good issue to bring up because I think people just want to do the right thing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah, all around. I, I think people always, they just want to do the right thing. But again, I think that's listening to, you know, um, how do I say this? Sometimes in LA, social activists have a louder voice than the actual people, mm. the Tomva people. And I want the Tomva people to have the loudest voice about their land and what they feel needs to be done. Yes, so, we do. Yes. Kind of we're, we're quick to jump in and, you know, social media around these things. But I think, you know, establishing relationships and beginning to understand and asking the whole element of the issue is important. I say that as we're on social media, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Ms. Sonna, you have been, you have been a rock star guest tonight. And I'm so appreciative of your time and your experience and sharing, sharing that with us tonight. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed their time in the chat and uh, watching live on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, good to see, good to see friends out there. Um, Miss Juana, uh, Miss Shawna, I, I don't know, I don't know why I keep wanting to call you Miss Juana. I, I, I don't know if it's um my, my so. Oklahoma accent trying to come out or or what it is. But uh, Miss Shawna, you got any uh? I love um, an Oklahoma accent. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, closing closing words? No, just nope. I think we already said them. For year round. <laughs> well, yeah, well, thank you for inviting having me here, and uh, and thank you. Th thank you, Mishana. Uh, stay stay on while uh, okay. while I close this out here. Uh, one uh, next week. We are going to have a very special guest. We're going to talk a little bit about climate change, um, geez, art, uh, another man, uh, uh, um, not another man, uh, a man who wears a lot of hats, just like Mashana, uh, Mr. Frank Etowagishik, who's Odawa and is the president of the Association on American Indian Affairs, by the way. He's going to be with us next Friday at the same time, same place, Robert Noonan. Um, so, so please be sure you watch. Thank you, Association on American Indian Affairs, for making our show Red Hoop Talk possible. And please, everyone, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. 
support the STOP Act, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.